your class. What, what's Ooh. <laughs> okay. I need to do that, but this guy's actually the language is hard. Yeah. Oh, good. He actually used to develop Linux back in the 121. When you're learning? Yeah. Yeah, and when it works. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. I really didn't have okay. to go to my office today, so I figured I'd come out here and enjoy the next session. Well, it sounds good. Yeah. I come out every once in a while. I think I was here for the guy that uh, was talking to the creator of like, the cheap ass games. Oh, yeah. Like that. that was interesting. It was. Once you make a move, I am. I do a lot of game creation, but not in like the computer world. Oh, yeah. I'm the games guy for the youth group at my church. So oh, cool. I'm always creating games for the junior high and high school and all that stuff. So there's a lot to be on like, you know, coming up with a concept and all of that stuff. It's very interesting. Everyone's <laughs> well You do D&D here? What? You do D&D? I don't. I never, uh, never got into that. It seems like my generation is like the D&D generation because I've looked on like Facebook and a bunch of my friends have posted D&D posts and stuff and I'm like, I never would have thought you would play D&D, but... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm old enough to like the original design, you know, but then, which is never ended. I didn't know anyone who... Yeah. I literally did not know anyone. <laughs> you know, I, I knew what it was, I had references in pop culture yeah. and whatnot, but I never, ever, you know, so it's behind the code stuff. <laughs> so now I just pretty much have to uh, get my references from the mini arcade. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> hey, let's go make it. So, there's the last recording. Well, um, uh, Mike's been posting his standard deaf ones on YouTube. And I've got my high deaf ones, and I want to like make them good and everything. But I've got Adobe Premiere, and it runs on Windows. And I borked my Windows install because in order to install Linux um, with my laptop that came with four partitions for some reason. I'm like, why would you do that? It's like Windows and it's system partition and like two recovery partitions put on by HP or something. I'm like, whatever. So I convert it to GPT, which is you know, just like load in Linux, convert to GPT, resize partitions, add all my Linux stuff, and then I go to boot into Windows and it's like, I can't find your boot partition. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just reinstall and it'll figure out where it is. And then I go to the reinstall and it's like, oh, I can't install because you're using GPT. I'm like, what does that have to do with the price of rice? I was just using Windows. Yeah, so Windows can boot from GPT. 
partition yet. Apparently it can if you're using EFI. Yeah. So it detects your system as EFI and then goes, oh, okay, I'll let you do it. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Well, Windows 8 should fix that, but I don't think you can wait that long. <laughs> yeah. Why do you want to edit on your Windows laptop, too? Because my laptop's more powerful than my desktop. <laughs> I've actually got a good graphics card now. It's got a dedicated card, which is why I want to put into Windows on the hardware so I can actually use this GPU acceleration. Anyways, we're going to start, so. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, we've got a great speaker today, and uh, we'll introduce him in just a minute. But I want to um, have Mike begin talk with you a little bit about the Next Generation IT Club. If you haven't heard of the club, it's it's the computer uh, student club on campus. Um, we're, they're doing lots of great, um, great stuff. we planning for uh, events. Um, they have weekly meetings where they're, uh, you can bring your passion into those meetings and figure out how to make something happen, something fun happen on campus. Uh, they're also sponsoring the pizza uh, social after the uh, speaker. So we will thank them for that, for the pizza. <laughs> and uh, most important, uh, you've already paid your money to be a member of that club. It came out of your student fees. So, you know, you might as well get the most out of your experience here and uh, join up with them. And Mike will tell you other reasons for that. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm Sean Lowe. Chris on that. 
the CPU makes a little bit new less than two. So that's basically what we're up to. Um, I want to turn it back over to Brian. He's going to introduce our speaker, and we can pass the fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we've also started at the speaker series to uh, have Rebecca Cooper come up and tell a little bit about some of the internships that um, she's been, been uh, discovering and uncovering and uh, out there hunting for. Uh, some really exciting work that's, that's really open um, and kind of a variety, with a variety of businesses, large, small businesses, profit, for-profit, non-profit, uh, projects that could span uh, you know, multiple quarters, projects that might be done in teams, projects that you can do individually in one quarter. Uh, some paid, some unpaid, so lots of variety there. And we've really seen the internship um, opportunities just uh, expand uh, tremendously. So I want uh, Rebecca to tell you a little bit about those. And then she's actually going to introduce the speaker. Well, Brian, Brian pretty much said it all, so that's thank you, Brian. Um, <laughs> I'm Rebecca Cooper, the internship coordinator here at Cascadia. And we do have a, quite a number of internships available on Brian's, I call it Brian's website. Is that okay? The internship website. The internship website. So if you go to my Cascadia and click on classes and internships, you'll be able to view all of the internships that are currently available. Like Brian said, there are some that are paid, some that are not. But you can get credit for all of those. And it's, it's a really important part of your program because it's a requirement. And also, it's a great way to get your foot in the door at companies to find out, you know, what are these companies you want to work for. You can, and most importantly, you can get it, you know, something really substantial, something real meaty to put on, on your resume. So I highly encourage you to open the doors for students to make those connections. It makes all the difference when you go out to the project. So to be able to say, I not only have this education, but I also have this experience. So I highly recommend it. And come and see Ma'am, look at it over in the library annex. Um, so make an appointment to come and see me, either by email. I'm at R. Cooper. I'm writing this down. R. Cooper at Cascadia.edu. R. Cooper at Cascadia.edu. And I'd be happy to meet with you and you can work on a resume and just, you know, get you started in that way. But anyway, John Kidley here. I want to um, introduce him. Um, he is a senior network analyst from Puget Sound Energy. And here's a little bit about John's background. John started working in IT at Gonzaga University in 1985. He built his first Intel, Intel 80286 PC in 1989 and started Eastern Washington's third ISP in 1993 and sold applied research to largest ISP in Eastern Washington in 2000. He worked in system administration for four years, however, began to tire of learning new versions of the operating system every two years. So he decided to focus on the stability of network architecture rather than systems, and began the path toward network engineer and Cisco certification. He currently holds full individual Cisco certifications and specialties, including four Cisco professional level certifications. He recently passed the Cisco CCIE Network Security Written Exam and is currently preparing to sit for the lab in San Jose at the end of the year. He's currently the principal architect for Cisco's trust and identity management solution architecture and Cisco's unified wireless mobility architecture at Puget Sound Energy. So please take a moment and welcome John.
what I would like to talk about today specifically is um, some information that I used to talk about with my students because they would always ask me questions. I used to teach on the Cisco program at another college here in Bellevue. And one of the questions that would always come up is, well, you know, what direction do we go? You, you know already that you can program in systems administration, network infrastructure. What people don't realize a lot of times between Structure that you can probably dedicate your lifetime to learning it and not learn it all, which is why I want to focus on these areas because what you'll find is that there's enough diversity. Cisco is not just generic Cisco routing and switching. There's a, a tremendous amount of diversity um, within the technology uh, areas. And in fact, there are, Cisco breaks it down into specific technology tracks. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about these technology tracks. And the, uh, the, the big, uh, do I go enterprise versus service provider? Where do I focus my time? So that you can see, for example, if you want to, if you want to do the voice stuff, you, know, you, you read that the voice engineers are getting paid 300K. So you think, okay, I want to go voice. So if, if you're going to do voice, um, you probably want to focus on the enterprise technology. Hopefully what this is going to enable you to do if you decide to follow the Cisco track, it's going to allow you to focus sooner rather than later. Because what you're going to find is you might do like what I did, you muddle around in all of the areas for a few years before you find the area that you really like to go. So my objective is to try to help you decide where to focus first. And on that note, I would say it would not hurt to at least delve into each of these just a little bit to find out if this is the direction you want to go. Find out which of these areas you like the best. I was uh, mentioning to Rebecca before I started that uh, you know I looked at the 300K salary myself, and that's why I started playing with the voice technologies. What I realized was that I really liked playing with the voice stuff. <coughs> it's like toys. Okay? It's, it's, it hardly even seemed like work. And I didn't even realize that I would like doing that stuff as much as I did until I actually tried it. So that's why I say it's probably not a bad idea if you just at least dabble in each one of these areas a little bit. For example, you might find that you just really get off on BGP and MPLS. And if you do, don't focus on the enterprise. If, if you really like BGP routing, BGP is the, is the routing protocol of the internet. Uh, while we have multiple uh, interior routing protocols within an organization, within an autonomous system, within a system that is under our control, we can do all the OSPF or EIGRP or RIP routing, but on the internet itself, there's only one routing protocol. That's BGP. If you find that you like working at BGP, service providers are probably going to be the area that you want to focus on. And CCIP, the service provider, track would be the area that you would go down there. If you like working with large carrier class enterprise uh, or uh, uh, service provider equipment, I should say. So what I would like to do is, first of all, just mention the fact that there are, and, and before I even start talking about the actual tracks themselves, well, I mean, I'll, I'll back up, I'll come back to that again. Um, there are specific tracks uh, everyone would probably begin with the CCNA track. A CCNA is going to give you a very uh, basic foundation. One of the things I used to like to tell my students is it's very important, number one, uh, 
If you don't remember a lot of the stuff tomorrow, don't sweat it. Because repetition is going to be the key to learning this stuff. You have to do it over and over and over and over, which is why the uh, employers like to see experience. And what you need to do is you need to fill in this foundation. You have to do your time. And one of the important things to understand is you might be presented with, with a concept that just doesn't, it just doesn't sink in just yet. You just can't quite get your head around it. Okay? But don't let that bother you. And here's the reason why. Because maybe that concept is being presented up here. And what you're going to find is that until we have all these blocks filled in in the foundation, which is where the CCA comes in, until we have all these blocks filled in that foundation, some of these other blocks, they just don't, they just don't fit. They, they might just fall right through the cracks. So this is very much uh, where we have to build on top of what we already know. Again, one of the reasons why employers like to see experience as opposed to just uh, book learning. And let me say this about that. A lot of people may poo-poo the certification tracks. Ah, uh, here's paper certification. That's when I usually follow that with, ah, uh, you don't have any paper certs, do you? Because those paper certs will at least get you in the door. One of the things that is important uh, that employers already understand is that the certification process forces you to present an objective measure of what you already know. Okay? It's, it's an objective measure that, that they can use as a baseline to have some idea of what you know. And plus, the certification process forces you to have to maybe study something that you wouldn't have actually studied on your own. And therefore, and that, what you might find is, well, maybe that's the next a concept that's going to get you in the door at your next interview. Or what you may find is that's something that your employer, your current employer, could actually use right now. That maybe they're not doing things as efficiently as they could. So it's all these real subtle um, concepts that we might either just glance over or not quite fully understand that if we don't go and sit for that exam, we may not quite grasp that to the level that we should. So I will always encourage certification. Don't let anybody poo-poo the certs, but understand that the cert is not everything. It will get you in the door, but they want to see some experience as well. You need to be very well-rounded. Okay, so let's go back to the pyramid. So if something doesn't quite stick, don't sweat it. What you're going to find is that stuff that you may have trouble learning today Tomorrow will be very easy. And you almost don't even think about it. But you get to the point where you start, you go back and start learning these routing protocols all over again for the second time. And you think, why was this so hard the first time? Why did this seem so hard? It's, I pick this stuff up like that now. Well, it's because you've got the base filled in. Okay? So I would always encourage, and even if you go, if, if you're going to stay in IT, which I would encourage everybody in this classroom to do. And I'm also very pleased to see that there's a nice, healthy mix of um, uh, men and women in the class. This has traditionally been a very male-dominated field. But I guarantee you the ladies get paid just as much as the men do uh, in network engineering. There is no bias uh, when it comes to network engineering. Uh, CCIEs uh, don't make, doesn't make any difference. Uh, if you're a man or a woman, they make the money. So that I'm glad to see that. Some great opportunities uh, for ladies as well as the guys. So even if you're going to go in another direction, say you want to go systems administration, I kind of got burned out on, on building Linux servers and building Microsoft servers and having stuff change every couple of years and having to relearn stuff. Now, you might like that. Um, one of the nice things about the network engineering side of the house is that we don't see quite as much change. We tend to build on concepts that we already know, and while things continue to advance, we don't just forget about how we were installing Windows 98 uh, last year and 
learn a Windows NT or Windows 2003 or 2008 this year, or I mean, I'm constantly struggling with my Outlook 2010. Everything's different than it was in my Outlook 2007. You know, I can't even put a signature on my email. I have to go through and find out how to do things all over again. Okay, you won't find the same thing in the Cisco network uh, technologies. Uh, you will find that stuff tends to build, and that you uh, your expert level knowledge that you had last year will still be uh, good uh, this year. I used to build 2003 servers, um, NCSE, uh, in Windows 2003. I feel like a fish out of water if somebody put me in front of a 2008 machine. So you see all that training, all that technology, all that learning, it did me very little good at that time. I don't want to, I don't want to put down the Microsoft program at all, but this is just my opinion. Um, I tend to like, I tend to gravitate towards this more because I can continue to learn or continue to build on what I have already learned and what I know. And I'm hoping that this will help you make some decisions in the future yourself. Okay, so if something doesn't quite sink in today, don't sweat it. If routing seems like a difficult concept today, don't let that make you shy away uh, from learning these technologies. No matter which direction you go, I would always advocate that you learn something about the routing and switching technologies. Because even if you're in systems administration now, you can't, you don't, um, you don't exist in a vacuum. All these servers are plugged into switches. Either uh, Cisco 1000B virtual switches or uh, 3750 um, hardware switches, 4507, the, 6509, 6513 chassis, the real big switches. They, all, these, uh, all these devices plug into switches. And it's important for you to understand how the equipment that you're going to work with is going to interface with the rest of the network. And there is a disconnect if you don't. We see it all the time. People who are in our network operations groups uh, that don't quite understand how all these things fit together. They're not going to go as far. They're not going to do as well as the guys who do understand how all these pieces integrate. So I'll always encourage you to at least start with some foundation learning. It's, I would say, CCNA at a very bare minimum, or at least the, the uh, equivalent of the CCNA uh, curriculum, which is basic uh, routing and switching. Understand how, if you're going to go into IT, you know, learn those layers of the OSI model, and not so much just so that you can recite them at the bar and win beers, but <laughs> so that you actually understand that layer two is dealing with frames, and, and, and how we begin to encapsulate things at layer two, and layer three, how, it, how and why IP is different than frames. And when we start talking about the WAN technologies, and PLS, and frame relay, it, now, oh, frame, we just said that word. It helps you to understand where these technologies live, okay? Understand that as you send information from a PC to a server, that little tiny beam, it gets wrapped, uh, what we call it, encapsulated by a whole bunch of different layers. Whereas